everyone, and welcome to another episode of Monsters Manifested right here on DM Tools with Max McCool. On today's episode, we're going to be continuing our trek through the demonic monster types with the Shadow Demon. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. The Shadow Demon stat block can be found on page 64 of the Monster Manual, and its lore can be found on page 54. So, without further ado, Let's begin there. When a demon's body is destroyed, but the fiend is prevented from reforming in the abyss, its essence sometimes takes on a vague physical form. These shadow demons exist outside the normal abyssal hierarchy, since their creation results most often from mortal magic, not from transformation or promotion. Shadow demons all but disappear in the darkness, and they can creep out without making a sound. A shadow demon uses its insubstantial claws to feast on its victim's fears, to taste its memories, and drink in its doubts. Bright light harries this fiend and shows its distinct shape, resolving it from a blur of darkness to a winged humanoid creature whose lower body trails off into nothing and whose claws rend the victim's mind. And that's all there is when it comes to the lore of the shadow demon. There's a little bit of attribute text after the description, which reads as follows. Shadowy nature. A shadow demon doesn't require air, food, drink, or sleep. Interesting that the writers of the monster manual would determine to put this attribute of the shadow demon in the lore rather than in the stat block. However, it may also be in the stat block just as a form of redundancy. Let's say they decided to also implement it or put it into the lore or descriptive text of the monster. But I think that the shadow demon so far seems pretty intriguing. I like that it is different from the other demons in the sense that it's still designated as a demon, but kind of falls outside the typical structure or hierarchy or ranking system of the demons, of the lesser demons, that is. And I think that that can give us a lot of opportunity to play around with the shadow demon monster in ways where we could make something intriguing and or compelling for the players at our table when we run an adventure using the shadow demon. But before we get ahead of ourselves with all of that, let's move on to the stat block. The shadow demon is a medium fiend demon with a chaotic evil alignment. It has an armor class of 13. It has hit points that average 66 or 12d8 plus 12. And it has a movement speed of 30 feet as well as a flying speed of 30 feet. The shadow demon has a strength of one, a dexterity of 17, a constitution of 12, an intelligence of 14, a wisdom of 13, and a charisma of 14. Its saving throws include dexterity plus five, and Charisma plus 4. It has the saving throws of Dexterity plus 5, Charisma plus 4, and the skill of Stealth plus 7. The Shadow Demon is vulnerable to the damage type of Radiant, and it has resistances to the damage types of Acid, Fire, Necrotic, Thunder, Bludgeoning, Piercing, and Slashing from non-magical weapons. The Shadow Demon is immune to the damage types of Cold, Lightning, and Poison, and is immune to the conditions of exhaustion, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, prone, and restrained. Shadow Demon has the senses of dark vision for 120 feet, a passive perception of 11. It speaks the languages of abyssal and telepathy for 120 feet, and is a challenge rating of 4. Onto the abilities. Incorporeal Movement The demon can move through other creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain. It takes an average of 5 or 1d10 force damage if it ends its turn inside an object. Light Sensitivity While in bright light, the demon has disadvantage on attack rolls, as well as on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight. Shadow Stealth While in dim light or darkness, the demon can take the hide action as a bonus action. 
And that's it for the abilities. On to the actions. Or rather, action. Claws is a melee weapon attack with a plus five to hit, a reach of five feet on one creature. On a hit, it does an average of 10 or 2d6 plus three psychic damage, or if the demon had advantage on the attack roll, an average of 17 or 4d6 plus three psychic damage. And that's all there is when it comes to the abilities of the shadow demon. So not much in the way of traditional physical combat, if you would, stuff like sword and board combat. But that being said, it also appears to be pretty effective in its ability to resist all forms of physical combat or damage, if you would. And then it has immunity to your typical types of magic, as well as resistances to perhaps the less common forms of magic or common types of magic, save fire, of course, and acid, I suppose. But I think that the claws attack is a pretty significant move, even though it's the only action that the shadow demon may have, it seems as though it can do a pretty decent amount of damage, as well as a significant type of damage, where its claws do not cause anything like piercing or slashing damage or anything like that, but in fact use psychic damage, which is kind of a difficult magic type for players to contend with and defend against because it's not all that common. So I think that that's pretty cool and can be implemented in some interesting ways. So with all that being said, let's move on to some adventure crafting, shall we? Okay. So the first thing that comes to mind when I read about the shadow demon and look at its stats and think about how to implement it, I get this picture of something to the effect of a boogeyman or ghost stories, something like that, you know, things that go bump in the night. And I think that the shadow demon could fit this role really well. So immediately a way I could see the implementation of a shadow demon would be something to the effect of a town or settlement of people where perhaps what's happened is it's been rumored or legend has it that this place is haunted and you may not even necessarily have to have a town or settlement that is populated by anyone. You could have something like a ghost town, a place that's been abandoned because the residents of the area could not survive or they could not withstand the terrors and horrors that they faced on a nightly basis because of the shadow demon. And I think that that allows for a lot of ambiguity and a lot of questions to be asked, both by your players and by the people in your world, the NPCs and stuff like that. And it allows for the creation of a lot of rumors, right? Like, oh, word on the street is that that town is haunted by ghosts. Perhaps there's someone with information at the tavern and feeds it to the players and says, oh yeah, that place is infested with specters. Some people say, oh, that's just, you know, an old maiden's tale. The place is actually just run down and of no value, you know, and then you can have things like, oh, well, the place is run down and of no value because it was corrupted by the ghosts and stuff like that. So you can, you can add a lot of mystique and intrigue to an area like that with the use of something as ethereal, let's say as a shadow demon. And right then and there, you have a clean and nicely knit sort of small adventure set up for your table where your players either driven of their own curiosity, go and check out this place, or perhaps they are given a charge or a contract by an individual to go there and see what's up with the place so that they can clear it out and clean it up and perhaps make it habitable for people again. Perhaps there's a landowner and the landowner of that town is fed up of the area being uninhabitable when it's perhaps a prime location, right? It could be a town that was right on the corner of a crossroads. It was right alongside a large popular trade route or perhaps a very commonly often beaten path, right? So you could create an adventure like that where your players basically have to go in and just clean up this haunted ghost town and make it habitable for people again, right? You could even then incentivize your players by perhaps allowing them to 
lay claim to that town by the landowner or perhaps purchase it at a discounted rate because the landowner doesn't want it. Perhaps the landowner approaches the players and says, hey, you guys are new to town. Do I have a great offer for you? It's a beautiful little property right on the corner of these two streets. Imagine that if you would kind of a a, a huckster, you know, sort of trying to sell them snake oil, right? And say, yeah, this is a great piece of land. This is whatever. And there's a town already built around it. It might need some tuning up and whatever, but it's yours for the measly amount of X amount of coins. You guys would just need to go in there and clean it up. And so you could incentivize them with something like that, like monetary gain or with the gain of assets using the town itself. And all they quote unquote, all they have to do is go in there and clean it up and make it livable again. And I think that in that you could give yourself a nice quick adventure to just put together and place in front of your players, especially if perhaps you don't have a lot of time to prepare anything for a session for an entire session. You know, if this is, let's say a pickup game or something like that, you can quickly drop down something like this to your table and give them a a fun little adventure to go through. And at the end of it, they get a lot of money or they get the land itself and they save the day and they manage to take on some cool, interesting monsters that they might have to think on their toes a bit to overcome due to the fact that the shadow demon is so resistant and immune to a bunch of damage types and conditions. Although it is vulnerable to radiant damage, so hopefully the table has a a cleric or knows where to hire one. <laughs> Another way that you could use the shadow demon in a fashion that I think will be pretty cool is in the way of a recurring nuisance, if you would, for the players. And this would work more effectively, I think, if you were going the route of using demons and demonic monster types sort of as the baseline, if you would, of your campaign or your series of adventures of a leg of your campaign. And What you can do then is you can then have this instance where as your players are traversing the lands and leveling up and developing and becoming more and more powerful by way of saving towns and cities and the land, the realms in general from chaos and destruction by stopping these other types of demons, they are also creating a problem for themselves because every single time they destroy or defeat one of those other types of demons, those demons are all becoming shadow demons, right? And this I think could work particularly well if your players don't actually have the chance or the ability to go to the abyss and destroy the demon on their home plane, because that's effectively what happens, right? That's kind of the recursion of demons is a demon will appear on the material plane Some valiant heroes will go and defeat the demon and overcome it. The demon will fall on the material plane and its corporeal form will dissipate over time into nothingness and it will apparently disappear. When in fact what happens is that the corporeal or material form of the demon has in fact expired, if you would, but its essence has returned to the abyss and it can reestablish itself. It can manifest itself again and over time, it can return to the material plane to continue its havoc. However, the shadow demon, from my interpretation of the lore, is this sort of anomalous mutation or change where that process doesn't quite work correctly. And you have this monster that's sort of stuck in limbo, right? That falls outside the hierarchical system of the demons and its rankings. It appears on the material plane, is destroyed in the material plane, not the abyssal plane. However, for some reason, it can't go back there. So it ends up mutating and changing into this sort of branched out type of demon. So I easily come to the conclusion or to the notion rather that shadow demons can occur ceaselessly when your player's main goals are to defeat demons and clear the material plane of their destruction and chaos, right? So you have your players contending with lesser demons, more powerful demons, stuff like that. And every so often you can have them encounter a shadow demon, perhaps when they're already weakened a bit from a previous battle, perhaps when they're on the road traveling or they least expect it, 
you know, stuff like that and have it sort of crop up and be some trouble for them to contend with. And then you can present them with the opportunity to consider whether or not this is a singular monster that is sort of chasing them around on their adventures. Perhaps they come to the conclusion that it is, in fact, multiple demons that they've defeated sort of coming back all in the same way. Perhaps you have an instance where all of the previously defeated demons by the party have now convened in a singular spot, and there's a multitude of them that your players have to go up against. I would probably save that case for the time that your players are of a fairly higher level, because the Shadow Demon is only a challenge rating of four, but it has a lot of abilities that make it a nuisance. It has a lot of resistances, as I previously mentioned, and immunities to conditions and damage. So I don't know that you would necessarily want to put up your party of four players at level four against two or three of these monsters. It might prove to be a pretty deadly battle, but I think once they get into the higher levels, you know, once they get into the double digits, perhaps even mid double digits, you know, close, let's say 12 to 15 ish or something like that, you could probably throw three or four of these at them and they'd have a, a tough time, but they could probably with some strategy and coordination overcome that issue. I mean, the weaknesses of the shadow demon are pretty straightforward, right? So it's vulnerable to radiant damage. So if there's a cleric, that's pretty helpful. And the shadow demon also has light sensitivity. So while in bright light, it has disadvantage on attack rolls and perception checks. So there's tricks in which they could overcome the shadow demon and make it a bit easier for them. But I think as a first encounter, especially if none of them are familiar with a shadow demon and they don't necessarily have the information as to how they would be able to hinder the effectiveness of the shadow demon, it might be a bit of a tough time for them at first. Another way that you could implement the shadow demon as an adventure for your players is something that I would probably implement at the start of a campaign at lower levels, perhaps when your players are in that sort of three, four, five range. And that would be something to the effect of a sort of waste management team, if you would. So to give you sort of the broad strokes of my idea here, it would go as follows. The adventuring party that is comprised of the players at your table are effectively playing the role of, if you would, sort of a begrudging second fiddle to an already established higher power, higher skill, higher notoriety group of adventurers who go about solving problems, helping people, destroying evil, killing monsters, collecting treasure, loot, stuff like that. And what's happened is the already established adventuring troop has gone through much of the lands and cleared out the towns and cities and villages, settlements, swamps, anything like that of any evildoers or monstrous entities. However, perhaps because of their notoriety and fame, they do not necessarily return to those places to check up on them, to see how things are going to see how the people are doing, to see if any new threats have arisen or if a threat that they scared off has returned. And so what your adventuring party is doing is effectively traveling the lands, passing through these places, these settlements, these environments where this previous party has already gone through, be it any amount of time, really it could be a week has gone by, could be a month, could be a year. And in certain areas, let's say that were corrupted by demonic forces, that established party has already defeated what was the present force at the time in the way of some type of demon. However, because they didn't do it properly or they didn't take the care to ensure that the process was done appropriately, these demons have returned but manifested in a variant form of demonism in the way of a shadow demon. So in that, I think you can establish many things sort of all at once and fairly early on in your campaign. You effectively develop a rival for your party. You develop places of interest or places to go. You establish possible encounters with monsters 
and stuff of that nature for your players to contend with. You generate something of a reputation or status that people may or may not have of the already advanced existing party. And then you can also develop the motivations of the existing party or perhaps rumored motivations and why they're really doing what they're doing, right? And so you provide your players with an opportunity to run through a session or many sessions where the entire time they have this target in the negligent, lazy, already established adventurers that go in and save the day and and destroy the evil monsters or creatures or beings that are there and then ride off into the sunset to leave those places alone. And who knows what the outcome can be. And then you have a climactic encounter or battle at the apex of your campaign where your party now has to contend with this opposing party and how the opposing party interacts with yours is up to you. You could have it be where they mean well, but they were ignorant of that. They didn't realize it. And so now they're going to be more careful. You could have them be more jaded individuals. You could have them be outright careless and say, well, we did what we did. We got the gold. We got the reputation. We got the the glitz and the glory and the fame. So we don't really care what happens because we've already established that we did a good thing there. And if things became worse, that's not really our problem, right? So you can layer up a lot of different challenges for your players to contend with in what I think could prove to be a fairly interesting way, depending on how your players go about it, because you're providing them with a bunch of different things to consider and contend with in very different ways. And then whichever approach they decide to take or multiple approaches that they choose to take in terms of interacting with, dealing with the towns, the people, the monsters, that opposing party, you can build upon that and develop something that is interesting and unique and different and hopefully tugs on the intrigue of your players because you're providing them with the challenges that they are seeking to overcome. All in all, though, I think that the Shadow Demon is a pretty cool monster. its I know I say that a lot, but the Shadow Demon is very interesting because it seems to be this unique creature that, at least in the way of demons, that doesn't have very much in the way of physical prowess, doesn't seem all that intimidating in terms of actions. However, when you look at its abilities and you look at its resistances and immunities and its behavior, it can prove to be quite a troublesome monster to contend with. And you can play all sorts of strange, spooky games with it, right? You can create a boogeyman. You can create this sort of like haunted house type of situation or a poltergeist scenario, if you would. You can create something almost like an infestation, you know, where the failure of other individuals or the party itself in appropriately disposing of the demons by the appropriate means or methods can cause this sort of blowback or recurrence of this monster. And I think that that's a very cool idea. And I think it's a very cool concept to play with in terms of developing an adventure or series of adventures for your table. But that's all I got for you fine folks today when it comes to the shadow demon and how to implement it in your campaign. Thank you all very much for tuning in. I highly appreciate it. On next week's episode, we're going to be covering the Vrock, which is another interesting looking monster, very bird-like avian, if you would, type of demon. So we'll see what it can do and, and what the Vrock entails. But until then, please be sure to like the podcast, follow the podcast, rate the podcast, share the podcast to whomever you'd like, as it would help out quite a lot and I would appreciate it. And if you're listening to this episode of Monsters Manifested on YouTube, I'd kindly ask that you like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that notification bell thing. I heard it does stuff as it would also assist the podcast in growing, help the channel grow, help this get to the ears of more people that may be interested in this kind of stuff, might want to try their hand at DMing a game or running a game, but don't quite have a launch pad for it, or for anyone who's perhaps already an established dungeon master, but is experiencing a creative block or mental block in the way of what 
to develop for their players. And they may be able to use this as a resource or just even as a way to kickstart that creative engine and sort of get the cogs turning in their mind, if you would. But with all that being said, thank you all very much once again for tuning in. I highly appreciate it. I'm Max McCool, and I'll see you on the next one. Have a good day, everyone.